This is a story and technical analysis of the Redline Stealer, a form of malware that has quietly become one of the most pervasive threats to online privacy and security. First appearing on the dark web in early 2020, the Redline Stealer quickly established itself as a formidable threat designed to pilfer sensitive information from its victims, establishing a new era of digital thievery. As a matter of fact, according to the any.ron malware trends, Redline currently is the third all-time ranking global global malware, only second to Emotet and NJRAT. Redline Stealer operates with a simple yet effective modus operandi, targeting personal data including form field data and other things like account passwords, email addresses, home addresses, other PII or personal identifying information, credit card information, crypto wallet private keys, and infiltrating systems stealthily amongst many other things. That's a lot of functionality for malware, but how exactly does it work? We'll be going over that in a few moments but at a high level, the red line stealer is typically distributed through social engineering campaigns by no surprise. Once the malware is dropped and executed on the victim device, the information stealing process begins and like most malware, it will be controlled and communicated with over a command and control channel operated by a malicious actor. This command and control server is used to execute commands, disable system defenses, perform host or network discovery, and most importantly, exfiltrate information from the target as we'll see soon in the analysis section of this video. Redline Stealer is alarming due to its evasion capabilities sold on the dark web making it accessible to various cyber criminals of varying sophistication levels. As a matter of fact, in 2023, the Redline Stealer compromised several high-profile YouTubers and influencers, obviously demonstrating its capability to breach public figures' digital lives. With these widespread attacks, we saw a proliferation of very popular YouTube accounts being turned into malicious accounts that were used to propagate cryptocurrency scams and further distribution of this malware. You see, these targeted attacks led to unauthorized access, financial losses, and an erosion of trust between these massive influencers and their audiences. Now, with some history on the Red Line Stealer, let's explore its operation through some network traffic analysis. Here we are within Wireshark, taking a look at some traffic that captured some activity from the Redline Stealer malware. This packet capture was fully provided by Brad Duncan of Unit42, and I'll leave a link to the GitHub page hosting this packet capture so you can download it and follow along in this analysis. Now that we're within the packet capture, we're looking for various indicators. So let's first start by looking at DNS activity. We'll set a filter for DNS, and within this DNS activity, we observe various queries to various domains, some for weather coat and a bunch of others. As we scroll down, most of these domains appear to be legitimate domains, at least at the very top level. But when we get to the end here, we observe a domain called 623start.site. And here we can see that there is a request being made from an internal host to this domain. After this, we observe another request to another domain, which I think is pronounced gutalifonos.com. Forgive me if I pronounced that wrong. And these different requests seem to be a bit different from the other ones that we've observed previously. So now what we're going to do is take a look at the reputation of these domains as well as the IP addresses attached to them. We'll start first by copying the the value for this domain here and then the value for this other domain. We'll then do the exact same thing for the IP addresses as they were received as a response to the DNS queries to these domains. And within the DNS answers, we can then copy the address right here as a value. And again, we'll do the exact same thing for this address. Within virus total, we have the first analysis for the 6 to 3 start that site address. And we can see 14 out of 89 vendors mac this as malware or malicious. We see one from Fortinet, one from Bitdefender, one from Sophos, AlphaSoc, and several others. And we see that virus total classifies this as fission and even sometimes spyware. Pivoting into the details section, you observe other things about this malware, its categories, its last DNS record, its last HTTPS certificate. Pivoting into the details, we observe other things about this domain, its categories, its DNS records, HTTPS certificate, and even Google results. In its relations, we also observe other things like IP addresses related to it, which we have open right here, and even more on communicating files and files referring this domain. Same thing for the other domain. We see details that according to the ArcSight Threat Intelligence, this is malware payload delivery host. An obviously multiple sites marketed as malicious or malware. More details like the DNS records, popularity ranks, and other things are observed here. Now, for the IP addresses, we observed for the first one, 4 out of 89 vendors marketed this as malicious, and the other IP address, 1 out of 89 vendors marketed as malicious. Back here in Wireshark, let's continue our analysis by looking at HTTP requests. This might help us find 
various communication activities between the compromised host and the malware. We see multiple GET requests here to the malicious IP address that we just analyzed. Let's go ahead and pivot to follow this TCP stream. In here, we observe a GET request to this endpoint and a response from the server. After this, not much happened, but it does seem like this has something to do with Windows Defender. Definitely sauce. We also see a GET request to this domain here, which again, which is analyzed. Let's go ahead and follow this TCP stream. Here we see a GET request for this JPEG file, and then nothing much after, aside for some details letting us know that this site has been moved permanently, probably taken down. Let's go back. Now that we know that this addresses are strong indicators of compromise, let's look at any other requests that might have happened for these addresses. We'll go ahead and filter for ip.addr equals the first address here, 195.161.114.3. Now fix my typo here, and we can run that. We observe more activity here. Now that we know that there's some malicious activity going on, at least something to do with malware, let's go ahead and look at all the conversations at a very high level. By going into the statistics section, we can then take a look at the conversations going on in this packet capture. In this case, we're more interested in the IPv4 conversations. Now let's go ahead and sort by the amount of packets being sent and received between two different endpoints. And we can see in the top two communications, we observe communications between two internal IP addresses, but then another one to this other IP address, we've, which we've not yet analyzed. Let's go ahead and do an analysis on this IP address within VirusTotal and see if it's worth investigating, at least based on the amount of packets it's been observed in communication with this internal IP address. Back here in VirusTotal, we see that this IP address has been marked by 13 out of 89 vendors, again, as malicious or as malware. Now that we know this, we can pivot back into Wireshark and look at any activity that has occurred for that IP address. And here we observe several communications for this IP address. So with that, we can go ahead and follow this TCP stream for as far as it goes. Let's go ahead and follow this TCP stream. And here we observe several things that are extremely concerning in regards to what's happened on the compromised host. We see several requests back and forth between the host and the server. Everything from details about TXT files, doc files, key files, wallet files, seed files, several things within the documents folder, the user profile, and several subdirectories browser details, details from different browsers, various things for crypto wallets, including ones for Coinbase, Binance, BitApp, Phantom, and several others. As if that's not enough, there's more for AWS access keys, Azure secrets, usernames, passwords, Circle CI tokens, digital ocean access tokens, Docker emails, Docker passwords, Facebook details, Firebase tokens, GitHub tokens, CI deploy passwords, Google app credentials, Google API keys, Heroku, Mailgun, NPM, Okta, Sentry, Square, Stripe, Travis CI, and several other things. Obviously, there are a lot of things that can be stolen by the redline stealer malware if they simply exist on the compromised computer. Now, let's see if any of these things existed for a compromised user. We observe several things being sent from the compromised user, but as we get all the way down, we see what the attacker was actually able to get. We see an email, we see a password, we see a document, stalling from the documents folder, and really not much after that. But imagine if there were other things and other sensitive information stored on this device. The redline stealer would have been able to exfiltrate these different pieces of data from the compromised computer. Now, we've been able to dissect some bits of the functionality of this malware by taking a look at the network traffic observed from it. Now, I think that was fun, but that took us a good bit of time. What if we can observe this malware and see its activities and interactions live? Well, using a platform like any.run, we can do this. Even before the analysis, here, within the malware trends, we're able to see the details about this red line stealer. When it was first seen, when it was last seen, its origin, its type, and its global rank. And like I said earlier in the video, it currently racks as number three after Emotet and NJRAT. Further, we see various indicators of compromise like IP addresses, some of which we actually analyzed from our Wireshark capture, some hashes, some domains, some URLs, various analysis that are recent, some from the 10th of February, which is very recent, which is today, and we can actually open one of these to look at later, and even more details about the Redline Stealer, its description, its analysis, a breakdown of how it works, and even a customizable text report about it. We also see its execution process, how it's distributed, how to detect it, and here within the custom report, we see all the details about this malware nicely condensed into a very professional malware analysis report. Everything from file hashes, into indicators, tags, operating systems, analysis date, the behavior activities, and the categorizations, the configuration of the malware, some static information, the imports, even videos and screenshots of this malware, process activity, a behavioral graph, process details, all of these things we would have had to do manually by ourselves if we wanted to understand in depth how the malware works. But within this nicely condensed report, we're able to see everything about this malware, at least this one that was scanned, which could be a variant of the Redline Stealer. Even further, we 
see registry activity, helping us identify modification events that might have occurred from the malware. Even more, file activity and network activity of which there isn't much going on for this analysis. We also see some DNS requests. Now moving on, if we really want to interact with this malware directly or see what happened during its run, we can sign into any.run and if we have a sample of the malware, we can basically just upload it as a new task and analyze it. Now honestly, I do not have a live sample of this malware, so I'm just simply going to rely on other public tasks that have been done by other people who have analyzed this malware. So let's go into public tasks and just simply by looking for the red line tag, we can see various recent submissions of this malware and all the analysis that has been done on it. Now this one has multiple tags as it seems to be associated with different malware types and different behaviors. So let's take a quick look at it. Here we're able to trace everything that happened during this run from the start right at the left all the way through every single screenshot that was taken during different sections of the analysis. So it looks like everything started from normal and then it went on and then something was cracked. Boom ransomware. More and more things happened. We see an interaction with Facebook. With with Google and some other weird stuff going on here. As a matter of fact, we can actually even download a PCAP of this activity and even analyze it within Wireshark if we wanted to. Furthermore, here we see various things regarding process activity and various communications that came from this processes. The categorization, whether they were executables, whether they were compressed, see some PowerShell, some GET requests. Within the connections, we observe various UDP connections and TCP connections, various DNS requests. And, and here we have this threat section that gives us different details based on threats found by Suricata IDS. If we click into one here where there's a network children detected, we can see that these details were provided by the Suricata IDS, and this has something to do with the Koi Stealer CNC check-in. What's even cooler is we can actually pivot from here into an open AI analysis using ChatGPT to generate a report about this activity. And we can see here that this report gives us a very nice detailed overview of what happened here in regards to Suricata and the process that was executed. To the right side here, we have several things regarding process lineage. So grandparent processes, sub processes, and we can also see the processes that are consuming the most CPU as they're tagged in red. If you wanted to, we could also take a graph look at this activity. And here we see several lineages from the different processes and what sub processes that they deployed. Very, very in-depth. We also have the ability to see all the IOCs summarized. And these can be used for detection or hunting possibilities. So everything from file hashes to dropped executable files and their hashes, the domain requests, and IP addresses. We can see that in way less time, any run made our analysis process super efficient and it could even make it easier for us to immediately understand the behavior of this malware. In addition to all the capabilities anyone has to offer, they've recently released a Linux sandbox to aid in the analysis of Linux malware. As a matter of fact, according to IBM researchers, Linux malware saw a 40% increase in 2020. And I can personally tell you firsthand during my time as a cloud detection engineer, there was definitely an increase in Linux based malware, especially in the cloud. Using this new Linux sandbox, you'll be able to identify functionalities and extract necessary IOC of sophisticated Linux malware. So if you want to try it out in any run, be sure to use the link in the description below and basically follow through what I did to find public tasks for analysis. Or if you even have ability to get your hands on a live sample, then throw it in there and look at how it works. A huge thank you to any run for sponsoring this video and making security research and malware analysis easy and efficient for everyone. All right, so when we analyzed the network traffic for signs of Redline, we observed several unusual patterns such as repeated connections to unknown servers and a thirst for a ridiculous amount of sensitive data. We also saw that the Redline Stealer communicates with its command and control or C2 servers to receive instructions and also exfiltrate stolen data. And then we examined these communication patterns, which could then be used to identify and isolate infected machines in an actual enterprise environment. After this, we also used Anyron to speed up and make the analysis process a lot more efficient. This obviously saved us a lot of time and allowed us to dynamically observe the nature of the malware and further aided the discovery of various host and network artifacts that could be used for threat detection or threat hunting within our environments. So I hope you enjoyed this video and if you're looking to learn something similar to this on how to do a malicious investigation with Splunk for a compromised Windows system then check out this video that will be appearing on your screen right now. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.